So we are reading Hands of Light by Barbara Brennan. We are on chapter 22, page number one, uh, 202 of the book and page number 217 of the, uh, 217 of the PDF. General analysis of patient's energy system. To begin a healing for the first time, I usually do a quick energetic body analysis to determine how the patient utilizes his energy system in general. Noting the physical characteristics of the body to determine character structure. So One this is something we did in the previous chapter where the shape of the energy field, right? Where is the congestion there? And we had those pictures we posted on the group also. So she's referring to that to understand where the person is uh, coming from. Once I can see the structure, I know I will probably be working a lot with the chakras that are habitually blocked. I simply have the person stand with his feet parallel and shoulder width apart. I then ask him to bend and unbend the knees while breathing in harmony with this movement. This reveals a lot about how the person directs and misdirects his energy, which ultimately causes the physical problem. For example, the energy will usually not be flowing evenly up the legs. It is usually stronger on one side of the body than another. There are areas of the body that get more energy than others. All these imbalances are related to emotional and mental issues the person needs to meet and work through. For example, someone who is afraid to love will probably send more energy to the rear part of the body near the heart area, the will center, misdirecting energy that is needed to nourish the loving heart center. After getting a good idea of how the person utilizes his system, I used to do a chakra analysis by dowsing with the pendulum. Now, I simply psychically psych read the problem. So what is it? <clears throat> First, you make a visual uh, decision. Then you're looking at it energetically. And then you're using the pendulum, which we saw how the pendulum is chirking, uh, turning in each of the chakras to get an indication as to how the chakras are moving right so you're taking three levels of uh, checking for the beginner i suggest that you look at the structure of the physical body compare it to what you have learned about character structure which character structures are most predominant what then will be the psychodynamics involved which chakras are most likely to be misfunctioning? Review the tables in chapter 13. Okay, so <clears throat> over here, I, in my view, there are two aspects to it, right? If you're going to review the body type and then do the chakras, you may get biased. And of course, as you practice, you'll anyway get to know. So maybe it may be a good idea to actually check the chakras and then check with the body type, right? So that you can make an empirical decision as to what we are working with. This information reveals a lot about the balance of reason, will, and emotion, and about the active and receptive principles in the personality. It also tells a lot about the way the person is functioning in each of the areas that each chakra represents psychodynamically. Look at the structure of the physical body. All this information can be used to guide the person to a deeper understanding of the self and how he functions from day to day. So, you know, we start acting like a mirror to the people concerned, whoever is coming to us, and we just reflect back to them, whatever we are per perceiving. So <clears throat> they can actually see, start seeing themselves with an empirical or a witness attitude. This is extremely important in all kinds of healing, what I find. I now ask the patient to remove his shoes and any jewelry which may interfere with his normal lines of energy and lie on my massage table on his back. At this point, you may wish to do a chakra reading with your pendulum as given in chapter 10. 
I usually get out my crystals if it feels appropriate for the patient. As mentioned in the last chapter, when I use crystals, I put a large rose quartz crystal in the left hand of the patient and a large clear quartz in the right hand. I use a large amethyst with iron deposits in it on the first, on the second or first chakras to keep the patient's field pulsating strongly and to keep the person grounded in the body. A fourth crystal is my scoop. It is a clear, clear quartz crystal about one and a half inches wide by three and a half inches long. A large one gets very heavy in the hand and a smaller one cannot take as much energy out. This crystal has a very strong beam of light coming out its tip and that acts like a laser beam in cutting loose accumulated junk in the aura. I use it in the cleansing part of the healing. So Lumerian crystals, this is very, very popular. These crystals, they actually have lines outside, you know, and they keep growing. So you can get a Lumerian crystal which is, I think, what she's talking about. Two, alignment of energy system of healer, patient and guides. It is very important before first making contact physically with the patient to align oneself with the ever-present higher energies. To do this, I again bring my energy quickly up the chakras as described in exercise 22. I make an affirmation to align myself with the Christ and the universal forces of light. I pray either silently or out loud. I pray to be a channel for love, truth and healing in the name of the Christ and the universal forces of light. So again, <clears throat> she's getting the ego out of the picture. She's making a connection with that higher state of consciousness and then getting into the field of the patient. If you do not have a connection with the Christ, please, please use the connection that you do have to the universal holy, God, the light, the holy of holies, etc. I then silence my mind by closing my eyes and taking long, low, deep breaths through the nose while rasping the air against the soft palate. I sit at the patient's feet and hold my thumbs on the solar plexus reflex point on the bottom of the feet. This point, as defined by the system of foot reflexology, is located on the bottom of the foot, just below the ball of the foot. I then... So, <clears throat> this is an important point. And when we do physical biofield tuning, we actually place the... the that's the first point that we place the tuning fork in. Of course, in uh, live sessions, in online, we are not doing that. But yeah, that was one of the protocols that was done because it activates the whole body and tells the body that something is going to be happening. So she's using her fingers on those points. We tend to use the tuning fork. I then focus on my patient to adjust the three energy systems involved. His, mine and the greater forces of light. This can be done by scanning up through the crown of the healer's body and then up through the body of the patient to his crown. After this is done, one may make a quick survey of the organs of the body through touching the reflex points on the feet and sensing the state of the energy of each. The most important ones usually turn out to be the major organs of the body and the spine. So, of course, if you have multi-dimensional healing capabilities, it's always a help. So, she's talking about reflexology here, that what are the points in the feet which are sensitive? So, that relates to which organ? If you can perceive that, of course, you can start working on those organs energetically also. The imbalance points on the bottom of the feet will, either, will feel either too soft or too hard. The flesh of the foot may stay indented after you have pushed it with your fingertip, needing more resiliency. It may be too resilient and not indent at all. It may feel like a muscle spasm. Another way to describe the feeling you may pick up from the imbalance points in terms of 
energy flow is that they will feel as if a little fountain of energy is squirting out of them or a little vortex of energy is going into the skin at that point. The same is true for imbalanced acupuncture points. The acupuncture points look like little vortices of energy or tiny chakras. An imbalanced acupuncture point will have energy squirting out of it or it will feel like a tiny whirlpool that sucks energy in. You may want to run energy specifically into the points that need it. So again, <clears throat> if you know the acupuncture points, of course it is helpful. But what I find that when we get into these things, you can intuitively find where the points need the treatment, where they need the healing. That again starts to happen once you start practicing whatever you are doing. A. Channeling for healing. As you progress through the healing sequence, you may add another dimension to the channeling used to receive information. In channeling for the healing itself, you allow the guides to utilize more of your energy field in two major ways. The first is simply to allow different levels or vibrations of light to be channeled through your field. Usually, these colors and intensities are chosen by the guide. The person channeling simply keeps aligned with the white light or Christ light. A second way is to allow the guides to partially come into your field and do work on the patient's field through direct manipulation. So this is something that happens regularly in <coughs> shamanism where you're calling your healing spirits and you invite them to come into your body and then heal the patient through you, right? Using your body. This is something which normally happens. Many times, even healers will feel this happening because it's very natural and the guide, if you are open to it, will start healing through your system, right? Using your hands and energy field to heal the other person. But again, we have to be very clear that we are not doing the work. The guides are doing the work. So the ego must not come into the game. In both cases, allow your hands to be guided by the spiritual teacher. In the first case, the guidance and hand movements are general and we begin as soon as you put your hands on the patient's feet. In the second, they are both very intricate and very precise and are usually done on the higher levels of the feet. Five to seven. Many times the guide will reach his hand through the healer's hand and beyond going right into the body of the patient. This requires the utmost attention of the healer to what the guides are doing so as not to interfere. So this can also be something like psychic surgery, right? Where the guide's hand is actually going into the body of the uh, patient to heal the patient. And sometimes you can actually see physical manifestation of this also. Like John of God and there are many people in Philippines who actually practice this process of healing. For example, on fifth auric level healing, if you just get tired of holding your hand or moving it in a certain way and you want to stop, you must make it very clear to the guide and give him time to adjust the healing to allow for such an energetic break. Curing a hand away prematurely usually causes drawing a hand away prematurely usually causes an energetic shock to the patient who will usually jump. Then you have to go back and fix up the disruption you have caused. With experience, you will become familiar with sequences of energetic phasing that allow pauses if necessary. So the acupressure yeah. points. So the acupressure points have been shown. We can post this uh, diagram also. Shimangla can post it. Okay. Three, healing the lower four auric layers. A. Chelation, charging and clearing the patient's aura. To chelate, derived from the Greek word chel or claw, means to claw out. Reverend Rosalind Breyer, who founded and developed this technique, 
adapted this word to mean simply to clear the field of the patient by removing auric debris. Chillation also fills the aura up with energy as in blowing up a balloon and generally balances it. This is done by running energy into the body in steps starting at the feet. It is best to run energy in the most natural way that creates balance and health in the whole system. Energy is therefore run into the body from the feet up because energy is normally drawn up from the earth through the first chakra and the two chakras on the bottom of the feet. So again, this is very much like how we practice creating the reball, right? In the advanced in the <laughs> excursion workshop, in the advanced uh, focus 10 program or the reball exercise. So we are pulling in energy from the earth and then transmuting it and channeling, chan uh, channeling it. It's exactly the same process that we create the reball with. These earth energies are always needed in healing the physical body because they are of lower physical vibration. Thus, you are pouring energy into a depleted system in the most natural way it goes. This way, the energy body takes in the energy and carries it to where it is needed. So again, this is very important, right? We keep telling, saying, right, that you do resonant tuning to raise the energy level of the body, consume the energy. And then the energy starts to circulate, releasing whatever is not required by the, by the body or the stale energy, clearing up the knocks and blocks in the body system so that we can go into higher states of consciousness. So again, it's exactly what we are doing in the excursion workshop is exactly what she is saying over here. On the other hand, if you start at the area of complaint, the energy body may very well carry the energy to another location before it actually begins nourishing the area of entry. Since that is not a natural flow, it is not as efficient. Please see the chelation chart in figure 22.3. Succeeding figures in this chapter will show how one person's aura changed through a complete healing. When Mary first came to me, her auric field was clogged, dull and imbalanced, figure 22.4. There were blocks shown as dark red and brownish colors at her knees, pelvic area, solar plexus and shoulders. She had disfiguration in the solar plexus chakra that looked as if the small vortex in the upper left section was protruding like a spring that had been sprung. This disfiguration extended through the fifth and seventh layers of the field. This configuration is associated with the hydral hernia. Mary complained of pain in that area of her body and also had problems in her personal life in connecting deeply with people. The process of healing which took place over a few weeks not only rebalanced, charged and restructured her energy field but also helped Mary to learn to connect to people better. This was done through channeling information about her childhood experiences in which she had learned to block her energy field habitually and thus eventually created her psychological and physical problem. Let us now go over each step of the healing as if you are the healer. So yeah, so again, we come back to the point where we actually create I mean, we experience stuff when we are growing up from the years one to six. And then that really leaves an impression in our field. And that stuff which is not serving us really needs to be cleared up. Sit with your hands on the feet of the patient, Mary, until the general field is cleared and balanced. Figure 22.5. Energy flowing from this position activates the whole field. Do not try to control the color you are channeling. Allow it to flow automatically. If you focus on a color, you will probably interfere rather than help because the fields are smarter than your linear mind. So again, we are working with the big guy, not the small guy. So we need to allow whatever happens to happen. 
As long as you clear your field so that your chakras are clear and can thus metabolize all colors from the universal energy field, the field of the patient will simply absorb what, is, what it needs. If one of your chakras is blocked, then you will have difficulty channeling the color or frequency of light that is transmitted through that chakra. If this is the case, repeat the chakra opening exercise till all your chakras are open. Figure 22.6 shows the flow of energy into the healer's chakras through the healer's vertical power current into the heart chakra and then out through the healer's arms and hands into the patient's auric field. As the energy is flowing, clearing, charging and generally rebalancing the energy field of the patient, you will probably feel it flowing through your hands. It is as if a fountain flows forth from them. It may feel warm or tingling to you. You may feel the pulsations which are slow and rhythmic. If you are sensitive in this way, you will sense the changes in this flow. Sometimes there will be more energy flowing up one side of the body. Then the frequency of pulsation will change and so will either the direction of flow or the general location the energy is filling in the patient's energy field. At this point, the flow is into general auric body areas. Right. So the point here is again, you have to start becoming sensitive to where the energy is flowing. You know, you can have, you have to develop that feel and that field of vision to be able to actually visualize it. You can actually see it with closed eyes also in my view. After several minutes work, the intensity of flow will diminish and there will be simply be an equal flow of energy up both sides of the body. This means that the overall field is generally balanced and you are ready to move to the next position. Note that Mary's aura as shown in figure 22.5 is already a lot clearer than her presenting aura shown in figure 22.4. Now, move around to the right side of the patient with one hand always on the patient's body. To maintain the connection, put your right hand on the bottom of the patient's left foot and your left hand on the patient's left ankle. You will have to reach across the patient's body to do this. Figure 22 7. Allow energy to flow from your right hand to your left hand through the foot of your patient. First, the flow of energy may be weak, then, as the rivers of energy flow fill up, the flow of energy becomes strong. As the foot fills with energy, the flow between your hands will again decrease. Now, move your hands to the right foot and ankle and repeat the same procedure. Fill it with energy the way you did the left foot. Now move your right hand to the left ankle of the patient and your left hand to her left knee. Run energy from your right hand through the patient's lower left leg and into your left hand. At first, the flow may be weak and probably stronger on one side of the leg than the other. When the filling is complete, move to the right ankle knee position. Figure 22.8. As you chillate between the ankle and knee, the dark clouds on the right thigh and hip clear, and the fields then there brightens. Then some of the darkness on the left side of the solar plexus begins to clear. Continue working up the legs, joint to joint, knee to hip, left side, right side, figure 22.9. As you continue to work up the body, the patient's aura will continue to clear and she will enter into an altered state of consciousness. Move from the hip to the second chakra, figure 2210. Now the patient's field in the pelvic area clears, especially in the area between your hands. In this position, your right hand is on the patient's hip and your left is in the center of the second chakra, right above the pubic bone. Repeat on each side of the body. You will be aware of the changes clearing in the aura 
by the rising and falling of energy flow as you move from one place to the next. As you place your hands on a new place, the energy will first flow slowly until the connection between your field and the patients is made. The flow will increase and peak, then slowly decrease and either stop or continue at a very low rate. This means it is time to move. The energy flow will feel like tingling or heat waves. Always make sure you get an even flow of energy up both sides of any part of the body before moving on. This includes both sides of each leg as well as both sides of the body. So again, in healing, balance is very important. After the second chakra is thoroughly these are the pictures. Cleared, charged and balanced, move the right hand to the second chakra and the left to the third, figure 20 to 11. With Mary, you would need to spend more time on the second and third chakras because they are the ones that have the most blockage. When you have cleared this area, put your right hand on the third chakra and your left on the fourth. As you begin to chillate directly into the chakras, you will enter into a deep communion with your patient. You may find yourself breathing the same rate she is. This means you are mirrored. Once you have become mirrored, you can pace her breathing by simply changing your own. Hers will follow. It may be important to do this at this point in the healing because you will begin opening up emotional material when you move into the chakras. As soon as emotional material begins to release, the person will try to hold her breath in an effort to hold down the feelings. So this is something that I experience all the time, mirroring, right? Whenever you are going into a space, you need to slow down your breathing and allow and connect with the space or the person concerned. And you will find that the rhythm of the space or the person will start to resonate with your breathing, right? So I, I found this when my Sasuji was, I've shared the story before, but when my Sasuji was in hospital, I used to do the same principle, his heart, his uh, breathing patterns, breaths per minute. When I used to reach, there was anything between 40 and 45. And just by doing this, we used to reduce it to 15. And that's when he used to go to sleep, right? So again, this mirroring concept is a very powerful concept and something that we all should use. Mary is now beginning to try to hold her feelings as the second and third chakras become more connected. You encourage her to breathe. She does and she cries. She feels her loneliness. So do you. You may feel or see Mary's childhood experiences that relate to it. Share them with her. She understands the connection now and cries some more. So now this is also important, right? In any kind of healing, Whatever the block is, if it can come into the awareness of the client, the clearing of that block starts to happen much, much better and much quicker. So this is something that we experience all the time in biofield tuning also. A second and third chakra open and clear more as a result of expressing her feelings. If you have trouble tolerating the feelings, change your breathing to stop. Again, various pictures of the clearing. This then the PDF, so you can actually see it. Facing and lift your consciousness to a higher level. Lever. Continue to send energy. As Mary's chakras clear, she becomes calm and quiet. Figure 2212 shows the chelation has cleared the lower four levels of Mary's field, but it has not repaired the tear. The third chakra will need special attention on the fifth and seventh layers where the tear is. To chelate chakras four, five and six, simply continue up the body, putting your left hand on the upper chakra and your right on the lower one. When you get to the fifth chakra, <coughs> most patients are more comfortable if you put your left hand 
under the neck instead of on top of it. Then, after that is finished, move each hand to each shoulder as you slip your body into a sitting position above the head of your patient. Balance the right and left sides of Mary's energy field. Then slowly move your hands up the sides of the neck to the temples, running energy all the while. At this point, if you are a student, you will move to sixth level healing described under point six. Do sixth level healing and a closure on the seventh level as described under the heading ceiling Ketrick template level. In the beginning, do not expect to do any more than this until you become proficient in healing. At first, this will probably take you a good hour to complete. After many hours of practice, you will begin to perceive the upper layers of the auric feet and will then begin to work on them as described under points four and five. Even later, you may perceive above the seventh layer and begin to work on the eighth and ninth levels as described under point seven in the text that follows. Great. So yeah. Do we actually end up working in all layers of the aura? Again, it's a matter of perception, how we can actually perceive it. I ask all new students to do a complete chelation to ensure that they will not miss anything that needs to be cleared this way. Later, when they become more proficient in both running energy and perceiving the field, they will no longer need to chelate all the chakras. They will know how far up it is necessary to chelate. For heart patients, it is important to reverse chelate. That is, you draw energy away from the heart chakra because usually it is clogged with dark energy. At this point, I will give you a few more pointers about chelation. Remember, you are channeling, not radiating. This means that you raise your vibrations to the level of energy that is needed, and then you simply connect yourself to the universal energy field and let it flow, like putting an electric plug into a wall socket. If you don't heal in this manner, you will get tired very fast. You cannot radiate or direct enough energy from inside your own field to heal. You must channel it. Now, this is important. If you end up using your own energy, it can become a huge problem because you will start getting depleted. Your job in channeling is only to raise your level of vibrations so that you can complete the circuit with the UEF. To raise your vibrations to a higher energy level, the chakra opening exercises that you have done are very useful. By preparing for a healing ahead of time, you will start at a high energy and frequency level. Throughout the healing, you will slowly rise to higher and higher levels simply because you are in a lifted state of consciousness. Most likely, the longer you stay in it, the higher you will be able to get, especially if you stay centered and focused with good breathing. So again, higher, higher states of consciousness, right? It's like the focus level zone. You can go into a higher and a deeper state and then perceive from there. You can actually perceive much more from the higher states of consciousness. The best type of breathing I use is taking long, continuous, in and out breaths with very little pause in the middle. Breathing is done through the nose, rasping the air against the soft palate as in the exercises given in chapter 18. You can also focus on expanding your auric field. The more important thing to do is to remain in a sensitive, synchronic flow with the energy fields around you. A pause in energy flow may indicate what a higher frequency is about to come. Wait a bit. If it doesn't come, then move on as stated earlier. As you become more attuned, you will begin to feel changes in frequency of the energy flowing through you. Eventually, 
you will be able to hold certain frequency levels by adjusting your breath and focus. Absolutely right, right? We can actually control what is the frequency that we are radiating. Hold your hands slightly tensed, firmly on the body. Direct the energy that you are receiving with all your chakras through your hands and into the body. You may want to vibrate your body to get your chakras pumping more energy using exercise 25 described in chapter 21. In this part of the healing, you are probably using the energy through your lower chakras more than through your upper chakras. A lot of energy also comes up from the earth through the bottoms of the feet. Be sure to have your feet well planted on the floor. Visualize growing roots to the center of the earth and draw and drawing energy up through those roots. This process nourishes and charges the lower energy bodies. Always make sure your body is in a comfortable position to ensure free flow of energy. Again, your comfort is very important, right? If you are uncomfortable, then healing will become an issue because there's a stress in your system. The patient's energy system will take the energy and automatically move it to the area in the body where it is needed. For example, although your hands may be at the feet, the energy could be going up the spine and into the back of the head. While the chelation is being done and to prepare the patient for more specific work, the healer can use this vital time to read the patient psychically and communicate with the patient. This is the time the patient starts opening up and sharing personal history more deeply. A greater mutual trust occurs as soon as the healer puts a hand on the patient. The healer will also continue to scan the body for problem areas. In Mary's case, her aura has cleared and is much lighter as can be seen in figure 2212. During the chelation of the second, third and fourth chakra area, her emotional release has brought her into a deeply relaxed state. The first four levels of her field are clear, enough to support fifth and seventh layer work. Another patient might not be, even after a full chelation through the sixth chakra and might still need to have his field cleared more in specific locations of heavy disturbance. There are two major ways of such clearing. One is a spine cleaning. The other is to either to push or scoop or waste out of specific areas. Both these processes are again used in shamanism, scooping as well as pushing. B. Spine cleaning. At this point, the patient may need a spine cleaning. See figure 22, 30. It is, in general, a good thing to do since it cleans the main vertical power current in the auric field. However, given a one-hour session, most times I do not do it unless there is a spinal problem because other things are usually more important and a normal spine will clear during chelation. Part of this technique was taught to me by my teacher, C.B. To do a spine cleaning, Ask the patient to roll over onto the front of the body. Be sure you have a table with a face plate or nose hole so that the patient can look straight down. He should not have his head turned to the side for this work. Massage the area of the sacrum. Using the thumbs, massage the forearms, small holes in the bones through which the nerves pass in the sacrum. That is the area above the gluteus maximus, where the dimples are. Look up the sacrum in an anatomy book if you don't know what this part of the body looks like. 
It is a triangle shaped set of fused bones with the tip pointed towards, pointed downwards. That has five four arm ends along each side of the triangle. The last number vertebra sits upon it and the tail bone extends down towards from its lower tip. Make small circles with your thumbs in the area of the foramens of the sacrum. You will be sending red-orange energy through your thumbs. Work in this way all the way up the spine from the right side of the patient's body, using your thumbs on each side of each vertebra. Circling clockwise with the right thumb and counterclockwise with the left usually works best. Now, cup your hands together over the second chakra. Channel red-orange energy from your hands into the chakra while making a slow clockwise movement with your hands. To do this, you must be able to hold your energy flow at the red-orange frequency. This technique is taught in Chapter 23 on healing with color. Charge the chakra. When it is charged, begin to move your hands up the spine. Let the light turn to a blue laser-like beam as your hands leave the second chakra. Be sure you do not drop the energetic connection as you move up the spine. You will have to position your body in a way so that you can move comfortably along with your hands as they move up the spine. With your blue laser light, you are cleaning the spine and pushing all the clogged energy out the top of the head through the crown chakra. Repeat the whole sequence at least three times and until the main power current is clear, cleaned. You may want to lightly tap the fourth and fifth chakras to help them open. Great. So again, very clear, right? We mean to move the energy and then focus the colors that are given. So it's also, I think, we need to make a lot of notes if we really want to get into this. But this can be done intuitively also. You can just intuitively allow things to flow and they can actually flow through you. Provided you are, again, operating at a higher level of consciousness. Cleansing specific areas of the patient's aura. During the chelation, you will begin to sense through his high sense perception where you will work next on the physical body as you become. Again, the diagram. Uh, have I missed something? Yes, you missed. As you become more advanced, you probably won't need to chillate through all the chakras before you start working more directly on an area of clogged energy. After a lot of practice, you should at least chillate up through the heart before concentrating on one area. Allow yourself to be led intuitively. More direct work is done by running energy into a clogged area to energize it and knock the stagnated energy loose and or by directly pulling the clogged auric mucus out with the hand. So again, when in shamanism, you do the same thing, but what they do is the, the, uh, the power animals or the helping spirits are working through you and they take this mucus or this energy which they are lifting out and throw it into a water source. The water source may be a hundred kilometers away, but in when we are going into these altered states, the assumption is that time and space don't matter. So the energy is being left into that because water dissolves the energies that we are taking out. So we don't take it out and just leave it in the room itself. In uh, in processes like pranic healing, they have a bowl of salt which they put it in, or they they imagine that there's a, a purple flame and they put the energy into the Purple flame. To run energy directly into a specific area, you can use your hands either apart or together with your hands on either side of the block, front to back on bottom to top of the body. You can direct the energy to move out of one area into 
and into another by pushing with your right hand and pulling with the left or vice versa. See chapter 7 for push-pull stop techniques. At times, this is right to do. At other times, you will feel it more appropriate to use both hands together. Either technique directs the energy directly into a block and cuts deep into the aura. Each also floods new energy deep into the aura and is a good method to fill the chakras. Figure 22 to 14 illustrates both hand positions. For the closed hand method, cup hands together with crossed thumbs and palms facing downward over the area into which you are directing the energy. Make sure your hands come together. So again, the okay. diagram, so again, the diagram is there. You can see how they're doing. It's between them or between your fingers. Fingers should be slightly cupped. Vibrate your hands to increase energy flow. You will find that by doing this, you can direct energy like a beam of light deep into the body. It can fill or it can knock things loose. The guides will direct you as to what is needed and run the appropriate energy through. If they are using this technique to knock blocks loose, then they will shortly change the frequency that they are sending through and probably reverse the energy flow and suck the block out. Simply allow your hands to move as needed to accommodate the outward pull. You may want to lift your hand with the dead or bone energy and allow the guides to lift it off your head. <clears throat> Another technique is to use your etheric hands to pull the blocked energy out of the patient's feet. To pull this energy out, imagine that your etheric fingers appear to get very long or the etheric parts of the fingers grow long and penetrate the body of the patient and simply scoop up the energy like a shovel or rake it together to be scooped up. You simply pull it up and out of the aura and hold it in your hands while the guides enlighten it. That is, energize it until it turns into white light and let it go. That way you don't get your room full of dead energy. Then you, as healer, go in for the next handful. When appropriate, you can also pull clogged energy out with the use of a crystal scoop, which catches the energy and pulls it out. See chapter 24. A crystal is a very powerful tool in this kind of work as it acts like a laser beam. It goes in, cuts and collects the energy, which you then pull out and let the guides turn to white light. So again, every crystal will have its own propensity, you know. When you start working with crystals, then you can understand that which crystal will work better, how it will work better. Of course, there are many uh, training courses also on the use of crystals, but they're a very powerful way of actually enhancing energy. Personally, I don't use crystals so much, I use toning more, I use humming more than crystals, but yeah, we have a lot of crystals and crystals can also do a lot of work. It is not always good to use crystals. Some people are just too sensitive for this kind of cutting action. Never use crystals after the Ketrick template work. A higher level work to be explained later is done. Using them then could just tear out the template work. The patient should not need crystal work after the template work. It should have all been done beforehand. That is on any given area of the body. In Mary's case, as in Mary's case described earlier, no crystals were used. While this work is being done, the healer can scan the auric layers to see if the chakras or organs need restructuring on the template levels. The guides will choose whether to work on the etheric template level fifth or the ketheric template level seventh. The template work 
can only be done after a good deal of cleaning on the first four layers of the aura has been completed. In fact, if the aura is very dirty, sometimes it is hard to see the ketric temperate level through the dark energy. So it's always better, you know, when we get into healing to prepare a foundation, to prepare the base and then move, in, move into deeper healing. This is something that I found because of doing all the biofield tuning sessions. In the training, they used to take us directly into the timeline. But I find now that if we set the earth star, sun star, clear the channel, and then come into the chakras and then move into the timeline, it's a much better procedure for the client. The stability that the client gets is much better if the base is clear. So what she's saying here is clear the first four layers, get it out of the way, and then move into the higher fields or higher frequencies. If the guides decide to do Ketrick template work, seventh layer, the healer must take the crystals away from the patient because the crystals help hold the patient in his body. For the Ketri template work, it is necessary for the patient to partially leave the body. Otherwise, the patient may experience a great deal of pain and the work could not be done. So this is being done in the seventh layer of the aura where the basic blueprint is, right? So naturally, if the patient is in the body, the work may not get done properly. So you're asking the patient to click out a little bit and then doing the work. I tried to sew up a small tear in the seventh layer once without removing the crystals from the patient's body. The patient began to scream in pain after about two seconds work. My hands were not touching the body. I quickly removed the crystals, finished the sewing and healed the large red inflammation I caused on levels 1, 2, 3 and 4 by the clearing techniques described above. If the guides decide to do etheric template work, fifth layer, at this point in the healing, it is not necessary to remove the crystals. I believe that this is because the etheric template work template works in negative space and is not connected to the body in a healing way. So the, the fifth layer is not, you know, you have each layer. What is the connection? And if the connection is not there, you may not feel the pain. You may not feel other stuff. But again, we have to start becoming sensitive to the layers, which is, again, not an easy task. We have to work on it. Practice is what we require. Okay, we can stop here today.